It appears that the Anglo-French intervention in Libya in 2012 had specific spillover effects, not least the destabilization of the Sahel region. A number of non-state actors gained access to weapons and bolstered their networks and could challenge a series of weak states. Germany's position not to engage in the 2012 intervention appears, with the benefit of insight, vindicated. Today, Berlin is assuming responsibility for the destabilization in the region. Mr. Koop, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I would like to start today's discussion with a question which concerns Germany's weapons embargo policy. Is it effective and why? Well, it, it depends on what you could define on if it's efficiency. If you see uh, concerning uh, Libya, you can see uh, the flight movings coming into Libya and you can see that it doesn't work perfectly as we uh, used to think that it, it could work. On the other hand, if you ask, is it, uh, does it make its point to, to reduce weapons in the region? Probably yes. But of course, we are not uh, satisfied with the, the amount of success uh, of this embargo. And uh, I think that uh, all attempts have to be made to increase uh, the, uh, its power and uh, to, to work at it. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that um, the change of the CDU leadership would means that there is a change in Germany's uh, foreign policy? I don't think so, to be honest. I mean, it's uh, the foreign policy is one of the few areas where you don't have um, that large uh, differences even between the different parties, uh, either it's CDU, CSU or SPD or Liberals or even Green Party. There's a quite large uh, amount of uh, agreement concerning foreign affairs policy. So I don't uh, expect that uh, the change of uh, to, to Armin Laschet in our party will change uh, anything. And although we don't know who will become our candidate for chancellery in, in autumn, I don't expect whoever that will be, that there will be a dramatically change in, in foreign affairs policy because uh, there's a very great amount of... Uh, common uh, arguments and common views in, in our party concerning this point. So I don't expect uh, that there will be a dramatic change, but of course I cannot uh, um, say it will not definitely not happen, but I think that uh, you don't have to be in sorrow. Uh, I think the, the red line will be visible uh, after September um, again. Yeah, most certainly interesting times are up ahead. Professor Barak, as the main author of the tactics uh, report on Libya, do you agree with the assessment that France and Britain got it wrong? In, and was Libya the only catalyst for the destabilization of the Sahel region? Okay, so there are several dimensions actually linked to Libya and how things uh, move forward from 2011 onwards. So when it comes to France and Britain and the fact that they wanted to be pioneers, I would say, in provoking the change in Libya. Uh, obviously, they did not rely on a strategy that was positive or that, that happened to coincide with the interests of Libya or the interests of the Libyan people. What I mean there, and it is an argument now that is well known actually among observers and experts and that is being used by countries such as Russia, for example, the fact that the R2P has been turned into an RT, R2O, meaning the responsibility to protect, that was the basis of the UN resolution that allowed, that paved the way to this intervention in Libya, it was there. And obviously, I think that the main point there is not the fact that there would be a change. I think this is positive. We agree on it. But we're 10 years uh, we're 10 years on from the Arab Spring, and what we can see is that Libya is still in a situation of war, that there are still foreign agendas also that are coming, and I would say connecting with the evolutions within the country. And add to this the fact that when it comes to a revolution, I think that the revolution needs its own pace. So there is no easy answer, of course. People will tell you, yeah, but 
we, could we allow people to be slaughtered, to be killed? No, of course not. But at the same time, I think the problem is that this revolution has been, I would say, reoriented towards the interests of other countries. And to be fair, it's not only about France and Britain, of course. I mean, the US also is among the countries that want to take and try to take benefit of perspectives, not to forget about other countries also that try to be the first on the picture when it came to saying we liberated Libya. So all of this to say that, yeah, there was definitely another way to do it. And I think that the Tunisian track and up to a certain extent, the Egyptian track were more on the right way to do it because it's their natural path, actually, or that natural pace, actually, that developed up to having results that we can agree on or disagree on. But that's another story, of course. Can you elaborate uh, further on these uh, uh, countries, let's say, that support non-state actors and seem to want to make a profit from this? So, I mean, uh, the main point is about Libya, of course, but then we have a kind of connection or spillover that we can mention in the case of the Sahel region taken as a whole. But to start with, with, um, with the case of Libya, Libya is about militias. Libya, up to 2011, did not have an army. And this is what I think actually uh, brought, I think, the, the, the crumbling of the institutions in Libya. Because in other countries, Tunisia, Egypt, even Syria up to today, the fact that the crumbling of institutions has been limited or did not happen is the fact that you had a strong army that was there to carry the operation. I know, I know it's a controversial point, but I believe that an army can also have a neutral role when it comes to preserving some kind kind of institutional uh, shape and security. So brought to Libya, of course, there are militias on the western part of the, of, of the country, in the western part of the country. There are also militias in the eastern part of the country, though they deal with the Libyan National Army that is not an, that is not an official army, but there is a stronger body compared to what we have in the west. And then in the southern part of Libya, in the Fezzan, you have a myriad of several organizations or several, sorry, uh, movements that are uh, engaged in traffic and smuggling that are definitely, I would say, reflecting the total absence of institution and the security vacuum that comes along with it. So from this, of course, to the fact that there are some external actors that try to take opportunity of this, that try to deal with militias directly in order for them to have an advantage. It goes from Middle Eastern countries to Asian countries to European countries. One example that we have um, on, the, on the European side is how Italy has managed to develop tracks with some militias because it wanted to control migrations. And this is one example among others. So Libya has a lot of these examples where states deal with militias because it's, it, it does not know how to deal with a strong institution that would be there. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, not I don't want to, 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 to be monopolizing uh, the, the word, I'm monopolizing the dialogue here, but just to add on the Sahel and its evolutions. But in the Sahel, we know also that there is working fragmentation that is ongoing there that is not new but at the same time it is true that countries that would be willing to take opportunity of the evolutions in the Sahel could be tempted to engage in relations or engage actually with some far form of cooperation or with deals uh, with these uh, with these organizations or movements that happen to be strong on the ground. It is too early to look into details related to that. I mean, more than anything else, because we know that lots of these movements are categorized as terrorist radical movements that even the UN bans stuck into, though I think that we should consider at one point to what extent we're talking to the Taliban. So why not talk to some of these organizations? One has to be pragmatic. Uh, but the problem is that this void that we are having there is definitely a void that could be either taken opportunity of by states that come from the outside or could be taken opportunity of also by other groups that are building up on the vacuum that we have in these countries. I'm thinking of Chad, I'm thinking of Burkina Faso, I'm thinking of Niger. All of these are problematic uh, situations. So this is where I'm not sure that in 10 years time, since 2011, 2012 for the Sahel, we've moved positively. I think that on the contrary, uh, it's even that we're focused on a security strategy, trying to kill the ones and the others among the leaders. 
but I mean, look at what is happening in other regions, in other countries of the region, such as what NATO is saying about Afghanistan and Iraq, actually. The same is happening in the Sahel. If you, also, if you have insecurity for sure, but the problem is that if you only focus on the military security approach, I'm not sure that you're working on the roots of the problem at the same time. Thank you for that. Mr. Kub, it seems like there is an exit strategy which comprises of strengthening local states to deal with transnational terrorism. To what extent do you feel that this is working? Yeah, I, I believe it, it, it can work, but you have to, have to look at a very long time uh, if you have this as, at your aim, because um, if we look at Mali, for example, um, the German Bundeswehr is uh, present in two missions. Uh, they are uh, one European one and uh, one of the United Nations. And I think that it's a very vital, um, vital thing that the Bundeswehr is uh, present at this place. But if you talk to um, the soldier, our soldiers uh, in Mali, they all tell you, well, you have to be patient. Uh, this approach doesn't work within two or three years, but it has to you have to be patient and have to look that it will last maybe uh, five to ten years. And um, I'm, I'm not really sure if I look at the current situation, especially in, in Mali and uh, the surrounding countries, if we have this time uh, to, to wait five to ten years. So there is a discussion in, in my party as well. Is, is it enough what we are doing right now to to educate and to train uh, the regional troops? Um, I'm we haven't found an answer on that now, and the missions uh, changed uh, in the last year. And I'm, uh, of course, we should wait and see what is the result of these changes. Uh, but I think it's uh, it's an approach. It's a race against the time, and we have many aspects and many uh, surroundings that are not very uh, in favor for us. The climate change, uh, the, the pandemic situation now. Um, and I'm not sure if uh, training and educating uh, the regional troops, which might last five or ten years, uh, is if, if we have this time. I'm, I'm not sure, but I don't have another answer right now uh, to this approach. That uh, brings me on to my final question, actually. Um, that, well, on a European level, how do you both actually think we can coordinate better to stop a proxy war in the Sahel region? Um, Professor Barak. Well, I mean, we know, we see well that the UN is kind of focused. It has to be focused on missions that would be validated by the Security Council. And I would say that its efforts are there in the Sahel, but at the same time, they're very limited. So this in change opened up or paved the way to having a stronger, if you could say, involvement from the from France in the Sahel region. We have the G5 Sahel, Barkhane Operation, and all these, all these operations that are ongoing, actually, and that are meant officially to bring together the efforts of the Sahel countries for, in order for them to fight better against radicalization and terrorism, and by extension to make it comes to what is announced. Now, the reality of things is that mission is not working so well. The uh, means are limited when it comes to both troops or when it comes to troops that are ready to intervene or when it comes to funds, of course. And this comes in a context where I think that one of the, um, of the limited aspects related to the French foreign policy is that France, uh, I mean, pretended to do things its own way, you know, to jump in there and to say, we're going we're gonna to show you, we know how it works, but just join us and bring us more money and bring more means and you're going to see what you're going to see. I'm sorry, since 2014, we're in this logic, actually, and we can see the result on the ground. Uh, we can see that the security situation is definitely not evolving, that, yeah, we can target one leader or one co-leader or the other, but it is not solving the issue, it is not impeding militias and groups from going to villages and building on frustration of people or on the quest of horizons, of socioeconomic horizons by, 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 by some people. And add to this that when you have operations such as the, as the one that happened in Mali early January, where we don't know still if it was a, a missile that fell on a wedding or if it, was, if it was an operation that eliminated some key people, we're still having versions and the others, etc. All of this shows the confusion also that we have there when it comes to the evolution in the Sahara region. So it's time to put more coherence, I would say there, 
And it's time also to have more cooperation, for sure. But I think that cooperation does not start with one country putting a stone and saying, okay, join us. No, I think that what you mentioned about the European level, for example, the European Union that wants to be, or the European Commission that says, we're gonna be the geopolitical commission. Well, you have cases that are put there and you have capacities and you have means, and we're not asking you to be biased towards one country or the other. It's just that there is a common threat that is called terrorism or radicalization, that even the UN talks about it. The EU has the UN as one of its compasses or one of its focuses when it comes to determining who is good and who is bad. So I, I think that we can build on a ground that already exists from a legal point of view and from a material point of view. The problem is that, and, and Mr. Coop knows way more about it than I do, but I would say that one of the main problems there is about the lack of coordination and the fact that there are some specific countries that want to bring it to their interests in instead of thinking collective. Mr. Koob, what's your take on this? Yeah, well, I think the, the German approach in uh, foreign affairs policy concerning the Zahar region is a, a dual one. One is, of course, talking about uh, the military situation, sending troops, uh, educating of uh, local regional troops, uh, cooperation with the G5 Sahel and ECOWAS uh, countries, of course, on one hand. But as already mentioned, uh, we cannot uh, solve this problem if we have a look only on the military aspect of this uh, problem. There's another one we have to increase uh, development aid and increase the, the situation of the society uh, over there. And uh, as I said, the, the climate change and of course uh, the pandemic situation, which is probably fostering the, the problems in the region uh, very strongly. And I think uh, what Germany can do is, as we did in Libya, as we did concerning uh, Mali, for example, hosting uh, conferences in order to collect money, in order to, uh, to improve the development situation, uh, giving money to the countries and not only to the countries, but to our development aid organizations in order to increase the situation in these countries. And if we are not able to, to work very uh, cooperated and very fast in this area. I think the military approach alone will not work. We have to increase both approaches and we have to work on both um, ways. And only if we are able to uh, encourage more European countries and uh, are able to encourage uh, the G5 more than and to make more engagement it will be a very very tough race against uh, the time but still at the moment I'm quite confident that we can that we can win this race against time but it will uh, afford we have to make very very strong and um, effective steps in the next years and I hope that the new American government uh, may probably join us in these attempts. That would be great uh, if uh, they could uh, do what they can do. So I'm still confident, but it's, it's very, very challenging. Thank you both uh, very much for your time today.